Jesus, the Savior of the world. We are gathered to worship, to proclaim Christ crucified and risen, to remember before God our brother Steve, to give thanks for his life, to commend him to our merciful Redeemer, and to comfort one another in our grief. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, who formed us from the dust of the earth, who by your breath gave us life, we glorify you. We glorify you. Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, who suffered death for all humanity, who rose from the grave to open the way to eternal life, we praise you. We praise you. Holy Spirit, author and giver of life, the comforter of all who sorrow, our sure confidence and everlasting hope, we worship you. We worship you. To you, O blessed Trinity, be glory and honor forever and ever.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may be seated. was terminal, the first thing that he said was, well, now I get to put the serenity prayer into action in a whole new way. So, uh, this is the song that we're singing, and uh, Steve would expect you to sing as well, which means you will. <laughs> we'll sing the chorus once. After we sing it once, then uh, you all can sing it the next time around. This world is full of so much pain and so much joy pours down like rain. I lift my arms and drink it in.
Good morning. On behalf of the Wilkinson family, I wish to welcome you each and all to this service of remembrance and celebration for the life of Steve Wilkinson. Whether you are here in Christ Chapel or with us through the gift of live streaming, we are glad you're here. Barbara and the entire Wilkinson family wish to thank you not only for your presence, but also for your words of sympathy and comfort, your years of friendship and collaboration, your love and your support. In addition, this morning we do want to thank specifically Gustavus Adolphus College, its president, Rebecca Bergman, its chaplains, its uh, faculty administration, and the food service in particular on this day. As you're well aware, following our worship time, we will be making our way to the Evelyn Young Dining Room. We'll follow the family to do that, and we'll use the first available door that goes up to Alumni Hall um, and walk that long hallway toward the uh, dining room. Because of the numbers gathered today, we will, at this time, say our table grace so that you can begin eating the minute you get there. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Bless us, O Lord, as we share the bounties of your earth. Bless the food we will be eating, the conversations we'll be having, the friendships will be renewing, and the hands, of course, of those who have made this meal possible. Nourish us so that we might be of service, loving service to others. In your name we pray. Amen. One note to add to our order of worship. Between the New Testament reading and the Gospel reading this morning, Eloise Sundahl, one of the Wilkinson grandchildren, will be singing Children of the Heavenly Father. So we thank her in advance for her courage and the beauty of her voice. At this time, I wish to invite Stephanie Wilkinson, Neil Hagberg, Deborah Sundahl, and Tommy Valentini to make their way here to the pulpit. Each of them will be sharing with you a few words of remembrance and appreciation for their father, their friend, their teacher. Wow. Um, again, Pastor Bray has expressed this, but thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for being here. Um, it's, it's overwhelming, and we got to see many people last night, but um, it, it, means, it means the world to us, and it means the world to my mom to get to hear the stories and how much we loved our dad, but how much you loved him too. And it's, this is what he would have wanted. Um, he went to great lengths to get you all here, and um, <laughs> it, it goes without being noticed, but... Um, he knew he could do it one way or another, and um, he would love it. So, a few um, We moved here in 1970 with, with me and my parents to this small Minnesota rural town. It, this was going to be enorm an enormous world for me, and my parents would show me and introduce me to many new and amazing things. Before it was a thing, my dad took his daughters to work. We went on exchange programs, J terms, spring tennis trips, and we worked at TLC. Our home was open to Gustavus and the TLC communities. Exchange students, students, faculty, tennis players, and instructors graced our home. Little by little, my da dad kept growing our world with the people that we met, expanding our horizons. At the time, I didn't know any different. This was the way everybody grew up, getting to know different cultures, different people, different ideas, and making things fun, but all with the same goal of getting to know one another, building a community, and making this world a better place to live. 
I remember my dad loved teaching. He'd read his students' journals that, they ha that he had them write during his course. He got the biggest kick out of the students who took his class because he was the tennis coach and thought this would be a breeze in the class. <laughs> when, when in fact, that he was told it was one of their hardest classes, but they learned the most. Growing up, Sundays would often be family day. We'd go to church in the morning, and many times we'd play tennis in the afternoon. There were times I wanted to go someplace other than the college courts. I selfishly wanted my dad to myself. See, who wouldn't love hitting against somebody who could get the ball back to you wherever you wanted it to go? I know for many of you it was the opposite and he hit to the opposite end of the court or love would love over your head. But we might be gone for an hour or two and it wouldn't all be tennis. There would always be people we'd run into and he would stop and say hello and my dad would always take the time to talk with them. What I didn't know at the time was that my dad was making my world bigger. He was leaving a little bit of himself with each of the people that he met. So while he talked, I worked on my serve, and we'd hit when he was done. And before we'd go, we'd pick up the garbage around the courts, we'd find the balls on the other side of the fence, and we would probably rearrange the shed, do a little weeding on the courts, and then we'd walk home. <laughs> Work play, love, family, fun, were all combined. But that's how we lived, and this was normal. And my parents made our world bigger by continuing to meet and include all of the people that we met along the way. Our home would be a consistently revolving door of tennis players. For some, some years, there could be up to 40 players coming and going through our home, coming to string rackets in the basement, Talking to my dad about tennis, about school, the lineup, something that had gone well or not so well, girlfriends. And as I got older, I had some of those conversations with my dad too, especially in college. I remember one in particular, a particular night that my dad was like talk, talking me off the ledge because I was focusing on a grade that I needed to get in order to get into a program that I really wanted to do. He talked to me in my dad's special way that in fact, no, I didn't have control over the grade of what I was going to get. Because I didn't know the questions on the test, I couldn't control how others would do on the test which would affect the curve. All I could do was study, and the rest was out of my control. It seems almost easy now, but at the time I went back and forth with my dad until I finally got it. My dad had patience. He had patience to see what he could see so clearly, and he waited for the rest of us to catch up. I know many of you had those same conversations with him and the same realizations. It might have been a different topic, but the calmness and clarity that my dad saw for you was the same. I know that some of this because you came to our house and I was waiting for my dad to help me with my homework while you were talking to him. I learned a lot listening and waiting. My dad really wanted to help, but he also knew that the person who needed the help needed to be ready to receive it. In 1977, tennis and live camp started. In the spring, when I was eight, I was helping my dad clean out his office as he was no longer going to be a professor. We were taking filing cabinets to the new professor's office who would start that fall. And I remember that I was kind of sad, kind of mad, because my dad wasn't going to have the same job. My dad was telling me how great this new professor would be. And I don't remember him telling me about his new adventure. But that was the summer TLC started and my world was about to get huge. With at times thousands of campers coming and going through each summer, I got to be part of something bigger. Summers were busy and I didn't get to see my dad too much. He was up before I was and he went to sleep after I did. But I knew that he loved what he did. There is a saying that on your deathbed, you'd never say that you wished you spent more time at the office. That person didn't know my dad. <laughs> When you combine everything that you love into what you do, there's no separation. There was so much more he wanted to do. He wasn't done yet. The messages of life were taught through the vehicle of tennis. It wasn't until I was older and I realized that not everybody did what they loved and loved what they did. I didn't understand that. My dad actually had to explain that some people did what they did in order to do what they loved. That was a new concept. After camps were done in August, we would go on a family trip. It was always fun and I really looked forward to it. 
My parents made it a priority to make sure we got to see our grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins. Plus, for that week or two, we got to be with our mom and dad. Growing up, watching my dad in tennis tournaments was nerve-wracking for me. I wanted my dad to win. I thought in my head how I could have superpowers, and I would make all of his shots go in, and I would tell him signals from the stands. But of course, he didn't need my help. He played on his own. He was the one with superpowers. As I got older, I thought it was fun to sit and watch and overhear people's conversations about my dad. I was always proud. When I was introduced to people and they found out who my dad was, it was special. Especially because it usually ended with a compliment about my dad or something really special that they had learned from him. See, along the way, my dad took the time to engage with people around him. The situations were new and not always familiar, but he engaged. Whether traveling abroad, or at a leper colony in Hawaii, or with students at Bishop Harai's temple, with a group of Hare Krishnas, or at a Lutheran church at home, or in Germany with my mom's parents, where he didn't know the language. My dad's language was of understanding, patience, love. A huge smile. Always a smile. I'm sad. I'm really, really going to miss him. I still had a lot to learn from him. And I wanted my children to be around him more. But the thing I know is that all along my dad's life is he took the time to meet and get to know all of you. And he left a little bit of himself with each one of you. So I know he will live on in us at Gustavus, at TLC, and we can continue to carry it forward. We can teach someone else something we learned from my dad. That is how you are all family. My parents weren't in, into it for a business. It was a family, and you were all part of it. My daughter, who's seven and a half, asked Omi, who's my mom, if she would visit more now. And the answer was that yes, she would certainly spend time with us. And she said, oh good, because Papa's going to spend a lot more time with us too, because he's all around us. And I know she's right, because I feel that too. That night after my dad died, I looked up to a beautiful, clear, star-filled sky with a beautiful crescent moon. It wasn't the way that I typically think of a crescent moon, but this one formed a perfect smile, and it was shining down on me. is called Before Steve. Before Steve, I did not know that an ego could be tamed with one prayer. I did not know that fear could be conquered with a smiley-faced racket. I did not know that winning could mean losing 0606. Or losing could mean winning 6060. I did not know that simply saying a name could be the key to unlocking someone's soul. I did not know that thank you was as important as I love you. I did not know that having a vision meant that not everyone will like you. I did not know that silence might be the best advice a person can give. Before Steve, I did not know that driving a 10-year-old van and living in the same modest house for 40 years could make you rich in what matters. I did not know that roll drying a court properly <laughs> could make one old guy so happy. <laughs> I 
I did not know that I could if I thought I could. Before Steve, I did not know that grief could press you down into your mattress for hours. And only love could make you get back up again. And I did not know that lifting one person up could make everyone around you fly, including yourself. Before Steve, I did not know that the face of life and the face of death are the same. A smile and a high five. <laughs> I start with an ordinary moment with my father, Steve. It was around 2006, and well before his cancer diagnosis. He came to visit our house while my mom was in Germany. He came to carve pumpkins with two of his grandchildren, Caroline and Eloise. And we were sitting in our laundry room there were newspapers and sketches of happy pumpkins, and they covered the tables, and sweet, childlike carvings were emerging. And then, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed that there was a blank chalkboard hanging on our wall. He had just moved in, and it needed filling. And I sensed that maybe my dad and a blank chalkboard might just lead to something good. So I asked him, Dad, what's your favorite quote? And without any hesitation, he replied, Winston Churchill, never, never, never give up. I wrote those words on our chalkboard that day with a little smiley face as well. And for the past 11 years, I've looked at them, and I've contemplated their meaning during our ordinary family moments of life. Those words took on new meaning with my dad's cancer diagnosis and through the publication of his book. <laughs> and what's remarkable as our, about our father, as Stephanie so eloquently said, is that he was true to his teachings, no matter the setting. My father taught and inspired his family at the kitchen table in the same way that he inspired you, on the tennis court, in the classroom, or traveling the world with his students. Never, never, never give up. You too may have experienced his determination and philosophy firsthand. If you played a tennis match against him, he may have run you from side to side on that court, pushing you to the brink, but somehow keeping the game equal. If you sat in his classroom, you were most likely challenged to think about competition, race, equality, religion, and in these discussions, he always challenged you to have empathy for another person's perspective. And if you experienced his coaching, you were ultimately challenged to use control both in the placement of the tennis ball, but more importantly, in the control of your sportsmanship, your effort, and your attitude. 
And if you were the last person at Station Drills at TLC receiving a service lesson, he would stay there with you, simplifying your service motion until you could hit it with power and consistency. And when you did, you got a high five and a smile. And finally, if you were engaged in conversations about his vision for the role of Division III tennis, especially on this campus of Gustavus Adolphus College, you would meet tenacity like no other, and you would soon understand that tennis can indeed be a natural congregator for all people. Never, never, never give up. Our dad brought this philosophy to our home as well. As a high school student, my father would sit with Stephanie and me for hours, helping us with our homework until we truly understood what it was to be taught. He told us, it's better to receive a B for which you gave full effort than an A that took none. When Caroline, Steve's oldest grandchild, was nearly one, he was determined to teach her to walk. <laughs> he took her fingers, and they walked around the Redlands tennis courts in California while Gustavus was playing a match for what seemed like hours. Caroline wore holes in her little pink shoes that day. <laughs> I have them. And she walked on her own soon after. On a visit to St. Peter, which is always our kids' favorite, Steve's second grandchild, Eloise, brought a book to her grandpa. Bugs Bunny gets a job. And she asked him to read it. As he read about how Bugs Bunny finds the perfect job in Glutz's Soda Fountain and Emporium, Eloise smiled from ear to ear. And that smile occurred the first time he read the book to her, the second time he read it, and even the third. And at a fall day at our cottage on the Mississippi River, my father had his four grandchildren around our table, and the prayer of St. Francis was on his mind, and he taught it to them. My father would say, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, and the grandchildren said, let me so love. My father said, it is in pardoning and the grandchildren that we are pardoned. And all the way to the end, where they said together, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Our father never declined an offer to spend time with our family. He taught us through his action that commitment, dedication, unconditional love for others, especially family, is the most important accomplishment in life. Never, never, never give up. So many of you sent emails or came to visit during our father's final days, and that made him truly happy. On one visit, a former player brought a very symbolic gift. It was a small but wise owl sitting in a little golden cage. There the owl sat in our living room with the door left open, ready to fly free. Our father, Steve Wilkinson, was freed from cancer on January 21st. 
and what he left for us are his simple and wise lessons that can guide how we approach tennis, our jobs, our relationships, and life. <clears throat> in Stephanie's and my final hours spent with our dad, we sat quietly on a living room uh, on his hospital bed, and we each had one of his hands in ours. And we talked about our memories and our wishes, and he squeezed our hands. And the last words that he whispered to each of us was, love you. And today we are gathered here to celebrate Steve Wilkinson's life. And I believe that he is here and he's whispering the same thing to you. I love you. And never, never, never give up. Love and full effort are necessary tools to live a life of service. Keep it simple, know your target, and work on consistency. And we can be inspired to carry this mission forward. So in closing, I ask you to look. Look at this place filled with so much love and so much peace. And in the words of Karen Gibbs, look at our abundance. Thank you all for being here. I can assure you that Coach is thrilled and grateful to have each and every individual sitting out there today here together. To see the people he loved all gathered in this space would have made him smile his classic Wilk smile. <laughs> Before I reflect briefly on what Coach has meant to me and to all of us who played for him and anyone who was fortunate to encounter him, I want to express gratitude to Coach's family, Barb, Stephanie and Scott, Debbie and John, Caroline, Eloise, Stephen, Audrey, and John, Mike, all of your extended family. You shared Coach with us. Through your grace and your kindness, you allowed him to share his beautiful light with so many. You accepted us as players, as students, as staff, to become a part of your family, to truly become a part of your life. The world knows him as a teacher and as a visionary, but foremost, he's your husband and partner, your father, your brother, and your grandfather. I have the life that I have. My wife, my son, my best friends, my life's work, my understanding of God, my understanding of myself, my understanding of others, largely because of him and because of what he created. This is true to varying degrees for most of us sitting in the room today. But without your grace and your acceptance of us, none of this would be possible. You let us into your family, and on behalf of our family, we want you to know that we are eternally grateful for that gift and that we stand by you and with you forever. Debbie and Stephanie, thanks for being our sisters. Caroline, Eloise, Stephen, and Audrey, you were your grandfather's true pride and joy. When you miss him and you want to feel close to him, Ask your moms and dads, and ask Omi to tell you a story about him. And ask us too, we've got plenty. We'll always be here to share them with you. Barb, Coach always said that if he was a father to us, you were a mother. He could not have been more right. And watching you care for him in the last six years, and especially in the last month, was one of the most beautiful and pure expressions of God's love I've ever seen. And it will inspire me forever. Thank you for teaching me and thank you for letting him be all that he was, which was pretty much everything. 
to me and to all of us. We're truly honored to be your sons. I've heard it said that death isn't something that happens to life, but rather something that happens in life. Only one moment, one event among an entire lifetime of moments and events. So it comes as no surprise that our coach faced death with grace, poise, class, dignity, and peace, the same way that he lived. When he could no longer stand or walk, he held the hands of those he loved. When he could no longer talk, he would whisper words of love and gratitude. True to himself to the last breath, he controlled what he could control. He let go of the rest, even death. And he always smiled, all the time. By all accounts, by any standard, Coach lived a truly remarkable life. There are no words suitable to describe the extent or the reach of his influence. What he gave to his family, his friends, his players, his staff, his campers, his students, his colleagues, this college, the community, our sport, and ultimately to the world, can't be quantified. All of us gathered here today are evidence of that influence. What Coach did, what he gave the world through his remarkable life, is eclipsed only by the way that he did it. He had the extremely rare and powerful gift of double vision. Not the kind he had after his last surgery, a different kind. All of us who played for him knew this well. As 18 to 22 year olds, we certainly were not at our best as players or as people at all times. <laughs> it can be a challenging time to say the very least. But Coach was able to see us as both who we were in a given moment and at the same time as who we were capable of being when we were at our very best. And then he chose to treat us as who we were capable of being in order to empower us to be that best self as often as we could. But at the same time, he loved us just as we were. Through this extraordinary double vision, he challenged and inspired us, while at the same time loving and caring for us. And in the process, he showed us how to do that same thing with everybody we met. Coach also empowered us simply through his example, how he lived every single day of his life. He was the clearest thinker I have ever known. He spoke precisely, and he acted boldly. He said exactly what he meant, and then he went after it with conviction. He believed in eternal values, and then he did the most difficult thing to do in all life. He lived them. He taught us to give our best, to be positive in all circumstances, and to love and serve others. This, he told us, was the true measure of success. This made our tennis, our lives, and our relationships matter. And then he consistently modeled this way of life for us to see. When we lost heartbreaking matches with national championships on the line, he would tell us how proud of us he was that we had focused on the things within our control and that we should not and we would not let beautiful days go to waste because something outside of our control, like winning and losing, didn't go the way we wanted it to go. When life presented him with challenges far greater than winning and losing tennis matches like Barb's cancer and later his own and everything that came with it, he embodied the serenity prayer. He chose joy chose love, and he always expressed gratitude. He never complained. He never made an excuse. He never put others down. He put them first. He did the hard work, the late work, the work that no one ever saw, no matter how he felt. He did it all in the name of making our lives better. Not because he wanted credit, but because he believed it was good, and it was right, and it was what God put him here to do. Even more remarkable, was that he did it with a smile, always his smile. And in the process, he showed us that we can live that way ourselves. He showed us what is possible if we choose love, serenity, courage, and wisdom. I was so thankful that Coach got to be here for the first six years of my time as head coach. He loved being at practice, he loved being with the guys, he loved watching matches and breaking things down and laughing and joking and being around them. And I knew that this was the greatest gift I could share with them. This November, he also came to my sport ethics class. My students had read Let Love Serve, and near the end of the semester, we invited him in to come speak. He was struggling physically, but you should have seen him. He was electric. He spoke and interacted with them for an hour and a half straight. They were glued to him. He was masterful, every comment expressing his wisdom, 
most comments expressing some humor, and they were all woven together as if he had written a million drafts. When I thought about it later, I realized he did. <laughs> when they all thanked him and left the room, I was packing up my stuff, and I asked him what he thought. He gazed out at the empty seats. He had one eye closed so he wouldn't see double. And he said with a smile, it almost makes you want to start all over again. I dropped them off that day to take a nap, and I think I realized that some people must feel that way when they come to the end of their lives, because they weren't able to do all they had hoped or to live as they dreamed they could. Coach, on the other hand, would start all over again, only because his life and his mission brought him so much joy, and because it brought so much life and goodness and rightness to others. I also realized that he doesn't have to start over. There is no starting over. There's just us, all of us. It's our responsibility, our honor, and our privilege to carry on what he did and how he did it. Through his life, he has given us what we need to carry on. We can't ask him for anything more. So as we celebrate Coach's life today, let us honor him by carrying on his legacy of seeing the best in one another. Let us be instruments of God's peace and hold on to values that, values that truly matter and then live them out even in the most difficult moments. Let us think clearly and act boldly and prioritize relationships. Let us choose joy. And finally, let us do what Coach always did, smile and express gratitude for each other. Thank you, Coach. Thanks for being our greatest gift. Thank you for what you gave to everyone here, to me and to the world. Thank you for always loving and believing in us. Thank you for showing us in every set of circumstances how to live. Know that you're always with us, alive and present in our hearts, minds, and souls. Guide us with your spirit, and know that we're blessed, honored, and proud to be yours. We love you. you all to join me as we read together Psalm 23 as it is printed in your program. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> Our second reading is a reading from the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians. Chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. St. Paul writes, You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him 
and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Here ends the reading. Stand as you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. From St. Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak. He taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Here ends Matthew's Gospel. Please be seated. <coughs> Barbara, Deborah and John, Stephanie and Scott, Caroline, Eloise, Stephen, and Audrey, Anne, John and Alyssa, Mike and Diane, other family members, friends, grace and peace to each of you in the name of Jesus, our crucified and risen Savior. Amen. 
In his Gettysburg Address, delivered 150 years ago this coming June, President Abraham Lincoln said the following words in honor of the brave men who struggled on that Civil War battlefield. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. In similar fashion, long after today's memorial service is forgotten, you will still remember the three crowns which Steve Wilkinson placed upon your heads. The smiley face that Steve drew on your tennis rackets. The serenity prayer which Steve planted in your memories. The names of his heroes, Karen Gibbs, David Austin, Carl Waltz, and Arthur Ashe Jr., who have become your heroes as well. These things and many, many more you will never forget. If I may be granted a few moments of personal reflection, one of the things that I will never forget is Steve's involvement in an ongoing First Lutheran Church Wednesday morning men's conversation group. This past summer and early fall, the eight of us regulars, including Steve, decided to read and discuss our way through Let Love Serve. With Steve as our guide and our facilitator, we walked leisurely through this book Wednesday after Wednesday <laughs> after Wednesday. <laughs> Truly relishing Steve's commentary, asking hundreds of questions, and marveling at a life lived so very, very well. Throughout these unforgettable months, we found ourselves with Steve as he grew up in Sioux City, hitting a tennis ball against his school wall. We were with Steve as he and his Jamaican tennis partner rode in Steve's 62 VW Bug through the Deep South in the early 60s. We were with Steve on January 15, 1966, when we all fell in love with a beautiful German girl named Barbara. <laughs> we traveled with Steve on his journeys as an accomplished national tennis player, and then we watched him carve out a teaching and coaching career at Gustavus Adolphus College. We rejoiced with Steve as daughters Deborah and Stephanie grew up and eventually had families of their own. We marveled at the birth of tennis and life camps. We celebrated with Steve the growth and maturity of countless gusty student athletes which with such names as Buderak, Whipple, Kaus, Lundmark, Miller, <coughs> Scanty, and hundreds and hundreds more. We were a captive audience as Steve articulated his philosophy of life and tennis, peppered with references to the three crowns, the golden rule, the serenity prayer, Gandhi, Federer, Nadal, no-cut tennis, and love. Most of all, love. We rejoiced with Steve as he passed the torch of tennis and life to Neil Hagberg and the torch of Gustavus men's tennis to Tommy Valentini. We also, of course, saw Steve age before our very eyes and witnessed firsthand his final years, months of cancer. We were amazed by his determination, his refusal to give up, and his smile. How privileged we Wednesday morning coffee and conversation partners were to have a weekly dose of Steve Wilkinson's infectious optimism and courage, an unforgettable blessing. It has been my honor to be Steve and Barb's pastor and friend for the last 15 years. And over that time, we've had many conversations covering all kinds of topics, including faith and scripture, 
religion and ethics, justice and peace, on and on. As you well know, Steve and Barb are first-rate theologians and deeply spiritual human beings. Steve was a Lutheran by choice, having grown up in a different Christian tradition. By Steve's own admission, his Christian faith was the lens through which he saw clearly his identity and his responsibility to others. Steve saw God, or divine love, as he so frequently called God, primarily through the life of Jesus. Steve admired Jesus greatly because he fed the hungry, healed the sick, visited prisoners, washed the feet of the poor, accepted harlots and society's outcasts, forgave people who crucified him, rejected holier-than-thou behavior, and reinterpreted the Mosaic law from the perspective of love. In short, it was through Jesus that Steve understood clearly what divine love looks like in everyday life. From Steve's perspective, one of the most beautiful expressions of the Christian faith is written in this morning's reading from Ephesians. By grace you have been saved, by grace through faith. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. We are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works. For Steve, this understanding of life as service, grounded in God's grace, was bedrock. No wonder he called his memoir, Let Love Serve. The other thing to be said is this. As grounded in his Christian faith as Steve was, he was never one to say, you must believe as I do. Just the opposite was true, in fact. Steve believed that divine love is universal. Steve had little time for Christians who used the word only in the profession of their faith. Here's what he wrote in Let Love Serve. I cringe when I hear or am expected to say the word only. Christians limit the universality of God, divine love, if we proclaim that God is revealed only in Jesus Christ. We deny universal grace if we limit it only to adherence of our own faith. The lives and teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, Hindu, Thich Nhat Hanh, Buddhist, Martin Buber, Jewish, and Sheikh al Alawi, Muslim, clearly illustrate how God is powerfully manifested in many religions and cultures. God is universal, revealed in all of the world's great religions, and not restricted to only one formulation of, un of ultimate truth. Steve's words. In a popular and provocative recent book called Why Did Jesus, Moses, the Buddha and Mohammed cross the road. <laughs> the book's author, Brian McLaren, has written that the world needs more Steve Wilkinsons. Well, to be truthful, he didn't mention Steve by name. <laughs> but he did say that the world needs more people who are strong adherents of their own religious tradition but at the same time, benevolent, open, and engaging in their relationships and conversations with people of different faith or people with no faith at all. According to McLaren, if more of us could be like Steve Wilkinson, we would be well on the way toward turning swords into plowshares and transforming the world into a peaceful planet where we would never need to study war anymore. This morning, with gratitude, admiration, respect, and love, we give thanks for the life, work, and ministry of our dear friend Steve Wilkinson. The world is a better place because of Steve Wilkinson. 
And I can only imagine that heaven is a better place now as well. We will miss Steve, but we know that Steve is with the God who gave him life. The God who claimed him in his baptism. The God who walked with him, his family, and his friends day after day, even through the valley of the shadow of death. And so this morning, we join Steve in affirming the words of the psalmist. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. So Steve asked for this song. He and Barb used to dance around the house to it. I think this is probably you, Barb. And the rest of us. Open that door. Greet the new day. Look at that smile, what can I say? You brighten up everything I do. And I am filled up, I am filled up with a joy that is you. Walk out the door, get in your car. You take it with you wherever you are. Every head turn, they're smiling too. The world is filled up, the world is filled up with a joy that is you. Oh joy, oh joy, oh joy, oh joy. Oh, oh, joy. I thought I was blind, I opened my eyes, now it's all that I see. My tears are washed clean from all I've been through. In that holy stream, the beautiful stream of the joy I see. You walls back in, my day has piled up. Hey, I can bend down, the last drop in my cup. You flash that smile, what can I do? My world is filled up with a magical stuff of the joy that is you. Oh, joy, oh, joy. Oh, joy, oh, joy. Oh, joy. I thought I was blind. I opened my eyes. Now it's all that I see. My tears are washed clean from all I've been through. In that holy stream, the beautiful stream of the joy that is you. There can be a day that's dark and gray, where clouds are hanging right to the ground. Then I step into the world of you, I feel it to the sun shining down. Well, I feel the joy. I can feel the joy. I thought love was blind. I opened my eyes. Now it's all that I see. My tears are washed clean from all I've been.
Gracious God, in holy baptism, you have knit your chosen people together into one communion of saints in the body of Christ. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to share the new life in Christ. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Give courage and faith to all who mourn, and a sure and certain hope in your loving care, that casting all their sorrow on you, they may have strength for the days ahead. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage, and who walk as yet by faith, that where this world groans in grief and pain, your Holy Spirit may lead us to bear witness to your life and light. God of mercy, Help us, in the midst of things we cannot understand, to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. God of mercy, God of all grace, we give you thanks, because by his death our Savior Jesus Christ destroyed the power of death, and by his resurrection he opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, will be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Let us commend Steve to the mercy of God, our Maker and our Redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Steve. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Let us go forth in peace in the name of Christ. Amen. We sing praise to the Lord the Almighty. Thank you.